now we've finished talking about the eye and now we're going to talk about some visual theories. We already talked about the additive theory and the subtractive theory of light that is adding or removing wavelengths to get a mixing that results in more white or more dark light. Uh, but now we need to talk about uh, some higher level perceptual theories. And so one of them is known as the trichromatic theory. This really comes from the idea that most individuals have uh, green, red, and blue cones. And it's the idea that all colors that humans can perceive must therefore be combinations of green, red, and blue. And it's the idea that if an individual were to experience color blindness, uh, such as in, in this photo, uh, that color blindness tends to be a malfunction or an atypicality in either the green, the red, or the blue cones, so that the colors of the visual light spectrum appear differently to them. So we can see up here in the left upper left quadrant is what uh, typical, not I, I don't like the term normal, but typical color vision uh, could be represented as, uh, versus in the upper right, we can see that the previously green and red appear quite uh, similar. So this is a very common type of green cone color blindness known as deuteranopia. And so this is the idea that a lot of greens and reds seem similar and a lot of blues and purples seem similar. Just below that in the lower right hand corner, we can also see what happens when the red cones malfunction. Because the red and green appear to be opposites on a color wheel, uh, these two types of color blindness actually manifest sort of similar uh, and and so those two pictures um, look similar to me if they look similar to you too that's that that's uh, expected but then if we look in the lower left hand we see a third type of color blindness and this is a malfunction of the blue cones and so this looks uh, more like the green and blue look similar and the red and purple look similar and the yellow and orange look similar and so there's lots of little possibilities in there and so the trichromatic theory is the idea, if you think about um, old school TVs and computer monitors, if you went really close up to them, we could see pixels on the, on the screen that were really just red, blue, and green. Uh, it's the idea that everything we saw in those TVs were really made up of one of those three colors. Another type of vision theory is the opponent's processing theory. And this is the idea that it's not just the three cones firing, but also the absence of these cones firing that can result in perceptions of color. And so it's the idea that um, when there is a cone that stops firing, we will see the opposite. For example, when a red cone um, stops firing, we may see things as more green. When a green cone stops firing, we may see things as more red because they're opposite on a color wheel. Uh, although we don't have yellow cones, when a blue cone stops firing, we may perceive things more as yellow. And with black and white, with those contrasts, when light, when light turns off, we'll see things as more dark, and when uh, light comes on, we'll see things as less dark, and the, the, the black and white are also uh, an opposing pair. And so a good way to explain uh, this opponent's processing theory is through the use of an after image. So the opponent's processing theory is the idea that if your neurons are firing, if, you're, if your green, blue, and red cones are firing, and then when they cease firing, your brain will interpret this not just as a lack of that, but the presence of the opposite. So what I would encourage you to do is take a moment to use this slide and stare again, we'll have another staring contest, at this black dot. Try your hardest to keep your fovea and your central vision uh, on the black dot. Relax your eyes a little bit so it's not working overtime and uh, just give it a moment or two. Now, did you see anything? Do you need to rewind the video and go back? Uh, what you might have noticed there is uh, a yellow, a teal, a pink, and a purple, uh, if you have typical color vision. And so what might have been happening here is when the blue disappeared, you might have seen that as a yellow. When the red, you might have seen that as a teal or viridian green. And when the green and yellow disappeared, you might have seen them as uh, green was pink and yellow was more purple. Uh, and that would be typical. And so what's happening here is although there's no pink light wavelengths of light, although there's no teal on this picture, we are creating a visual illusion. That is when we remove the green, we're seeing the opposite. We're seeing this more pinkish color. Um, and so this, this is very common. So this is support for the op op opponent processing theory of light. Important to note that both the trichromatic theory and the opponent processing theory, they're not mutually exclusive. Um, most psychologists today believe in both and they believe both have lots of merit. Uh, they were developed separately, but they help us to understand how we perceive light. It's not just a combination of cones, but it's also the opposites of the cones. 
And just as complicated as all these vision theories between adding and subtracting light and combining different uh, wavelengths of light and viewing the opposite wavelengths of light can be, it gets even more complex. That is, in our primary visual cortex, in our occipital lobe, we have many neurons designated to pick up on specific complex types of perceptions. We have neurons designated to pick up on movement, uh, somewhat like the T-Rex from Jurassic Park, if you will, the idea that they'll only pick up on when things move. We have neurons designated to pick up on lines and different neurons for uh, vertical versus horizontal versus diagonal lines or contrasts or patterns or textures. We also know that our brain processes visual information differently if it is symmetrical versus if it's non-symmetrical. So the two cupcakes here on the slide both look very delicious, of course, but the one that's slightly less symmetrical, our brain takes a little bit more work to process versus the one that's symmetrical, we, we can process that one faster. We also know uh, that there's many parts of our brain designated to pick up on faces, especially when faces are not really there, but face illusions are a fun little part. Uh, and so uh, down the corner here, I have two, two faces drawn. One of the faces has high contrast between the hair and skin tones and has a more symmetrical hairstyle, more symmetrical face. The other one has less contrast between the hair and skin tones. And because of the hairstyle, you can't see uh, the, the full face. And so what happens is both faces are very beautiful, of course, but the one that's asymmetrical, our brain has to do a little bit more work to process. Our brain has to do a little bit more work to fill in uh, what's behind the long bangs. Although we see it, um, many people, when they see that, that the shorter hairstyle, they would need to fill in the face and their brain automatically tries to um, estimate what the person looks like under their hair. And so it does a little bit more work. So we see that our brains tend to um, more efficiently process things that have high contrast and that have symmetry um, and have a preference uh, for looking at those things. Now, of course, not everyone processes visual information the same way. Uh, we find that there are some people who have what's called visual agnosia. And this is the idea that if I were to say, picture a red triangle, red uh, equilateral triangle, if you will, with a point pointing up. Can you picture a red triangle with the point pointing up? Most of us can, but for those of us who can't, they may be experiencing visual agnosia. This is the idea that in their mind's eye, they can't picture visual information. They can't picture a house or picture uh, cartoon characters or picture um, visualizations. Some people have a subtype of visual agnosia that's specific to faces, and this is called prosopagnosia. This is the idea uh, that they have a hard time remembering individuals based on discrete facial features like nose width, cheekbone height, lip size, what have you. The specific things noted with the face is too difficult for them to grasp. Individuals with prosopragnosia will have difficulty recognizing their family members and the people they live with. They'll have difficulty recognizing people they see every day. And so they will have different cues they use to recognize individuals, such as hats or clothes or voices, um, hairstyles, uh, because the discrete facial features are beyond their visual recognition. Now with visual agnosia, this is not the only way that sighted individuals may vary in their ability uh, to, to think and, and perceive. Another way we see individual differences in vision is through depth perception. So depth perception is how far away, how near or far objects may be. And we have lots of different techniques we use. Uh, some are binocular cues and some are monocular cues. For binocular cues, this requires the usage of two eyes. And we do see individuals that vary in their usage of binocular cues. The main types of binocular cues we like to talk about, of course, are retinal disparity uh, and convergence. So for retinal disparity, what we're talking about here is if you were to take your index finger and hold it out in front of you, and then you close one eye and you see where it kind of lands in your visual field, what's beside it, what's across the room from it, what's to the left and right of your finger, and then you close your other eye, you might note that the image you see is slightly different. What your finger is aligned with is going to be different. And this is because your finger's closer to you than objects across the room. And it's the idea uh, that what your left eye sees is different than what your right eye sees. And so retinal disparity is key to making things like 3D movies, uh, but it requires the coordination and usage of both eyes simultaneously. Uh, for individuals who have what's known as a lazy eye or only one working eye, uh, they're not able to use this as a cue for how near or far things are. 
Uh, another binocular cue is convergence. So this is the idea that if you again use your index finger or your thumb and you put it very close to your nose and then you take it very far away from your nose. And you try to just look at your fingernail and you bring it very close and you put it away very far um, and you watch it, you're going to feel the muscles in your eyes change. And we know that when it's far away versus when it's up close, um, your eyes look more straight, straight ahead when it's far away and your eyes cross and look more towards your nose when it becomes closer. And so this muscle feedback lets your brain know that things are closer. So as things become closer to you, as your eye muscles are more turned in, uh, we're going to perceive those objects as closer to us. Now, if binocular cues are not working uh, so well, I know it myself, my binocular cues do not work so well, uh, there's lots of monocular cues to help you out. Uh, so these only need the usage of one eye at a time. And one such binocular cue, it's pretty simple, is size. Uh, so this is the idea that objects that are smaller, we tend to assume are further away. So this is the idea in the Im image below, we would assume that the smaller hill and the smaller house are further away. We wouldn't assume that they're closer but doll sized. We would, our brain would make the assumption that it's further away. Uh, second monocular cue would be height. It's the idea that objects that appear higher up in our visual field, we tend to assume are, diff are further away. There's exceptions to this, of course, if there's overhanging trees that are close to us. But for most times, especially when we're outside, objects that are higher in our visual field tend to be further away from us. Uh, even indoor, if I was teaching in a large lecture hall, the students higher up in the higher up chairs are also the further back. So we would assume that they're the ones far away. A third type of monocular clue is, is that type of interposition. This one's harder to understand, but if we look at all these trees, some trees are overlapping, some trees are not. But if we wanted to guess which trees were closer, well, they're not just bigger and not just lower down our visual field now, but they're overlapping. We can see that some trees are in front of other trees. And so uh, if they're in front of other trees, we assume they're closer. So this is the idea if you put an object that's sort of behind something, then we know the one that's behind that we can't see the full thing is further away than the one we can see the full thing. So interposition. Fourth would be texture. So this is the idea uh, that as things are further away, their texture, their gradients will not be as uh, clear to us. So uh, if I was teaching in a large lecture hall, the students sitting in the front row, I could probably read what was on their t-shirts. I could probably see the dimples on their cheeks uh, versus students in the back row. I might be lucky to make out their noses, right? Like it's going to be way less texture. I, I might be able to just briefly tell you what color hair they have, but down front, I could actually probably tell you if they had highlights in their hair. Uh, so it would be um, more rich. So we can see here in the illustrations, the houses that are further away, I kind of tried to dim to make um, less contrast in their texture. Now this one's a little bit hard to understand, and this one is the idea that we use the size and movement of shadows to tell depth with one eye. Uh, so, um, yes, you, you can critique my illustration techniques. Again, I'm not a professional illustrator, but I'm trying to draw two mini putt uh, balls here. So these are golf balls about to fall into the hole in, at mini putt. And one of them has a dark, uh, they both have dark shadows of the ball at the bottom of the hole. But one of them, we can really see the shadows are a different size, both from the wall of the hole uh, is larger and the circle shadow of the ball is smaller. And so one of these holes would look more deep versus the other. My goal in drawing this was that the left ball, which ha should look like it has a more shallow hole, that is the ball shadow is larger and the uh, wall shadow is thinner, so the, the hole should be shallower. Uh, versus on the right, the ball shadow is smaller, letting us know the shadow is further away, so the surface of the bottom of the hole should be further away, and the wall of the hole is larger. Uh, this was a hard one to illustrate, but this is actually a cue myself I use regularly because I have poor binocular eye depth. Uh, when I'm doing things like going on stairs, I, I have a hard time estimating how deep the rise versus run of the stair is. So I will use the shadows on the stairs to know sort of how deep to expect the stairs. And if it's very sunny, there's no shadows. Uh, sometimes I struggle with the stairs. I have to use a handrail. Uh, and so uh, th this is uh, one of the cues that I use uh, a lot. 
Another type of monocular cue is that of linear perspective. And so this is the idea that the railroad track or the, or the converging lines lets us know that things are further away. And so I've kind of drawn some basics of a railroad track letting you know things are further away. I also draw two houses. One house should look more flat and lacking in depth, and the other house should show a little bit more depth, still an ele elementary image, if you will. Uh, but it's the idea that if you use the linear perspective, it allows us to aid in depth. Uh, so it's the idea if you were to try and draw things more realistic so it has the depth you would need to have these these more diagonal lines showing the sides of a cube or sides of a house and the last monocular cue and the last depth perception cue we're going to discuss uh, is a really fun one and it's called motion parallax and this is the idea if you were walking outside or driving um, things that change and move in your visual field will change at different rates based on how far away they are you could look at these three images and if you were driving in a car and you're driving on the left side of the vehicle like we do in North America um, and you would see the first, second, third image moving from left to right here uh, or if you're a passenger on the passenger side of the car you would move from right to left uh, we would see these images change. So it's meant to be you're driving by really quickly and the trees are going by really quickly and the signage on the road is going really by really quickly. The waterfall and hills are going by more slowly uh, but still more quickly than the mountain, which doesn't move. So the mountain's the furthest away in your visual field. It's not moving at all for this duration of time, but you've passed lots of road signs, you've passed lots of trees, and you're gradually getting past that big hill. Uh, and so this is the idea that things that move less slowly are going to be further away. Things that are just moving by really fast when you're driving on the highway, they're much closer to you.